Hi, everyone. Welcome to Machine Learning Experimentation with Data Version Control and Visual Studio Code, a live interactive event collaboration between Fourth Brain and Iterative. Backed by Andrew Ung's AI Fund, Fourth Brain helps you start the next chapter of your career in machine learning. Our cohort based course community helps you fill knowledge and skills gaps and ensures that every student is part of a team focused on building an AI product with industry standard tools. We believe in building by doing, and so we've asked today's guest as a resident expert at Iterative to show us hands-on how you can leverage data version control, also known as DVC, in your next ML project. As always, before we meet our speaker, let's meet each other. Our growing community is global and you never know what connections you might make at our event today. Let's share a little bit about ourselves and where we're tuning in from in the chat. I'm Greg Lochnane, the head of product and curriculum at Fourth Brain, and I live in Dayton, Ohio. What do you do? Where are you living these days? Let's make sure that we keep the intros coming in the chat. While many of you have probably heard of DVC, perhaps you're less familiar with the creator of DVC, Iterative AI. Iterative is a company that builds modular machine learning tools to streamline model development for teams. Recently, they raised a $20 million Series A, which will be used to build out their MLOps platform. The core idea behind Iterative is to provide data scientists and data engineers with a platform that closely resembles a modern GitOps-driven development stack. Today's session will serve as a deep dive into what DVC can do and will provide you with insight into what a GitOps-driven development stack looks like, what its implications are, how it differs from traditional DevOps and how ML practitioners like you should think about leveraging GitOps in your ML ops software development. The code that you see demoed will, as always, be shared with all of you as we get started with the session. A quick note on process, we'll hear from our speaker who will present the big ideas behind the way that DVC is helping to solve ML, pro ML ops problems in unique ways. And then we'll get into some code. Following the demo, I'll ask a few follow-up questions and then we'll open it up to live Q&A from all of you. Additionally, we have DVC developer advocate, Hema Pereño. She'll be monitoring the live chat and answering any questions you have in real time. So please don't hesitate to ask away all the way down to the syntax level. With that, I'm excited to give a very warm welcome to Alex Kim. Alex is a solutions engineer at Iterative. His background is in physics, software engineering, and machine learning. In the last few years, he became increasingly interested in the engineering side of ML projects, specifically in the processes and tools needed to go from an idea to a production solution. Alex, go ahead and take it away. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, give me a second to share my screen. Okay. So thank you, Greg, for uh, the introduction. Uh, so as uh, so, our topic for today is machine learning experimentation with DVC and VS Code. We'll start with uh, slides first. It's going to be like a few of them, and then we move on to a live demo to basically tie it all together. Uh, I believe the description of the event uh, contained a link to this repository. That's what we'll use uh, for the live demo. You don't need to uh, look at the repository right now. I'll explain everything that's in there uh, as we go. All right, so uh, we'll start with an example problem, something that we can reference throughout the talk. And that example problem will be uh, to predict uh, whether we can train a model to predict uh, customer churn at some fictional bank. So, so uh, to get us all in the same kind of mental space, let's imagine that we started solving this problem and we are at a point where we have a Jupyter notebook. 
I think this is something that many uh, people who work with data, data analytics, machine learning are familiar with, like Jupyter is probably the most popular tool in machine learning. Uh, and this Jupyter notebook will have some data loading code, some data cleaning and feature engineering code, uh, model training code, and finally uh, model evaluation, like producing our metrics, some uh, evaluation uh, plots, and so on. So now that we have this Jupyter notebook, like what now? Uh, what happens next? And many people will start asking themselves uh, questions like this, like what exactly was used to produce a particular model? Can I like can you easily compare many experiments, uh, many machine learning experiments that you did in that notebook? And uh, importantly, will be will you be able to reproduce them later? And the reason we uh, would probably ask ourselves these questions is because we typically want to achieve certain goals. And today I'd like to present uh, a set of three of those. So goal number one, we obviously want to achieve uh, the best possible performance, we, like predictive performance that we can get from uh, our data set, from our model. And oftentimes achieving best possible performance means running many, many experiments. Like you change a few things, you look at the performance metrics, change some more things, look at the performance metrics, and you keep iterating uh, and doing that. And when I say an experiment in the context, at least of this talk, but it also in general, what I mean is, is a very particular combination of your code, your data, and your configs. That's what I call an experiment. This is uh, eventually what goes into your machine learning model. So goal number two, we need to ensure reproducibility. So why is reproducibility important? Well, there's a few reasons. So first of, uh, first of all, improving model performance, like you cannot improve what you cannot reproduce, right? If you go back to an experiment that you made a couple of weeks ago uh, and you are unable to reproduce it, there's like really nothing to approve upon. Second thing is transparency and team collaboration. If you are not the only person who works on a machine learning project, like there's a few of you, you want to know everything that your team members did to achieve certain performance. Did they use a different uh, framework? Did they use a different model architecture? Did they use different preprocessing techniques, tokenization, and so on and so forth, right? So you need to be aware of uh, which changes uh, led to increased performance. And another very important point, especially in certain industries, is auditability, because some industries have laws and regulation in place when it comes to predictive models. For example, what exactly went into uh, the model that prescribes uh, treatment to patients or determines credit worthiness of bank customers? And finally, goal number three, ideally we'd like to have minimal setup and minimal or zero dependency on third-party services. And because there are certain problems associated with uh, uh, relying on uh, third-party services, like there's uh, obviously some kind of vendor lock-in. Uh, many experiment tracking frameworks require you to import their library inside your code and kind of pepper a few statements uh, such as like log artifact, log metric, log parameter. And you'll have those statements kind of spread out throughout your code base, which is obviously not ideal. Uh, but also when you would like to switch from this framework to something else, you need to refactor all that code, uh, which is a pain. Secondly, it's maintenance and cost. Uh, for some, even open source frameworks, they require you to maintain your own tracking server. That means spinning up uh, some virtual machine, maintaining a database that will store your metrics, configs, and parameters. Or if you don't want to do that, you can obviously pay for those services and the company will do that for you. Uh, but it's still like uh, you either pay with time and effort or you pay with money. Uh, third problem is uh, oftentimes within companies, they have security concerns when it comes to sending data to an external service or a database. Even if it's not training data, even if it's just like metrics data, it still may be a concern for your security team. So ideally you would want to keep all of that data 
within your own infrastructure. And if you are familiar with uh, other ML tracking uh, solutions, uh, some of the popular ones could be like MLflow, Weights and Biases, or Comet ML. Uh, those have at least uh, two of these uh, problems that I mentioned. And obviously, we have uh, kind of a problem here that it's difficult to achieve uh, all three goals at the same time. Like, we need to iterate quickly, generate many experiments. Uh, we'd like to automatically track all changes to codes config and data. We'd like to avoid dependency on third party services. And to kind of uh, drive the point home, uh, I'm going to show you some examples. Uh, for example, this is an example screenshot from uh, MLflow. Uh, what you see here uh, is five experiments, comparison between five experiments. Uh, every experiment is a column here. Uh, in the first uh, half, you see different parameters for those experiments. And in the bottom, you see metrics. So what you might notice if you look closely uh, is that all five experiments have identical uh, sets of parameters. Hyperparameters, like features, even random state is the same. Yet, if you look at the bottom, we achieved wildly different performance metric values. So, and that is unfortunately too easy uh, to achieve with these frameworks. Uh, like sometimes people do that and they like don't realize that this happened. And then a couple of weeks later, they return to an experiment and they're not sure which one, like what they did to achieve the best performance across five identically looking experiments. And it's not just a problem uh, of uh, MLflow. Like I'm not specifically like singling it out. It's a problem across many different frameworks. Here's another example, uh, weights and biases, which you see uh, is again, five uh, different experiments, same parameters, very different uh, metric values. And uh, with the uh, ML flow, some of you who are familiar with it, you've got like either two options, either you can self-host it and again, like maintain your own tracking server, all of the stuff that goes along with it, maintaining infrastructure, uh, user authentication and so on. Or you can go with like a paid route and pay uh, Databricks for that access. With weights and biases, it's not even open source, it's completely proprietary and it's a uh, uh, paid service. So when in doubt, uh, my recommendation would be always go with open source software. There's several reasons. We, I'm sure we all love open source. Uh, community and support is probably the primary reason is the fact that if you are using a popular open source tool, you get support from not just people who maintain the project, but pretty much all the user base of that project. And you often see some examples how this tool can be used in like very creative ways. They're built with, by people from that community, not by people who necessarily like the core maintainers of that project. Uh, you have low to zero cost because it's open source, it's free to use. Like in some cases, you may uh, again need to set up uh, some infrastructure like with uh, MLflow, but it's generally would be cheaper than paying for this. And also uh, open source projects have public roadmap and feature discussion, right? If you ever looked at a popular open source project on GitHub, there will be feature requests from community members core contributors and other community members will discuss pros and cons of different approaches. And you see kind of what you, you get a glimpse of what that product might look in the future because uh, all the discussions are public. So there are a few reasons why I think it's worth to be excited uh, about open source software. And today I'm proposing that we use a combo of uh, three open source tools. So Git is, uh, I think, everyone's familiar with or heard about it. Uh, so this is for versioning your code and uh, configs. Visual Studio Code uh, is also an open source uh, uh, ID, uh, integrated development environment for basically writing your code, refactoring your code, so on and so forth. And DVC, Data Version Control, uh, is another uh, open source project that lives on GitHub. Uh, and we'll use DVC for uh, 
creating machine learning pipelines that will eventually help us generate many machine learning experiments that we will be able to compare uh, with each other. And we'll be able, with this combination, we'll be able to achieve complete reproducibility by versioning everything. Code and configs will go into Git, data, models, and other artifacts, basically everything that's too large to be uh, versioned in Git will go into a DVC remote storage. And that could be any type of storage that you can think of. Uh, it could be cloud buckets from AWS, Azure, or GCP. It could be network attached storage, SFTP, and so on. And VS Code will serve as a convenient UI for experiment management. And uh, you will see what I mean by that uh, in, during the live demo. And with this combination, there is really no need to maintain or pay for any of the additional services. Like everything can be installed and used locally. No data goes outside of your uh, computer. So what is DVC? DVC is an open source command line tool. So uh, it has three sets of core features. So data versioning is pretty much in the name. This is what DVC most popular for. Uh, then it also allows you to construct your machine learning pipelines and enables experiment management. And the last two sets of features, both uh, machine learning pipelines and experiment management, they come with kind of integrated data versioning behind the scenes. So everything is versioned by default. You don't have to take any additional steps uh, to set this up. As I mentioned, it's uh, open source. It integrates natively with Git. And the final very important point in my view is that it's language platform and storage agnostic. Uh, in the live demo today, I'll be using Python, but you wanna use whatever language you're more comfortable with, R, Julia, or something else. Platform agnostic, whether you're on Windows, Mac, Linux, all major platforms are supported. Storage agnostic, again, as I mentioned, supports pretty much like virtually any type of storage that you can think of. And what are DVC pipelines? So DVC pipelines is a way for you to chain together very common operations that uh, we as like machine learning engineers and data scientists often do, such as uh, first we load our data from some source, can be an API or database. Then we may do some data cleaning, featureization, split data into train and test or train test and validation, train our model, produce the model, like save the model as some kind of uh, artifact, like a pickle, uh, and run evaluation on that model, produce uh, metrics and evaluation plots. And every single stage here can be configured uh, and, and parameterized. And ideally you want all those parameters live in some kind of central location. In this example, it would live in a text-based file uh, called params.yaml. Uh, and DVC pipelines, can be either a sequence of Python scripts, like for example, data loading can be its own Python module, featureization can be its own Python module and so on. Or it can be just one Jupyter notebook where all of these stages happen uh, within uh, the notebook itself. And DVC pipelines uh, are defined in a simple text file that has a certain structure. That's why it has an extension of uh, .yaml. And within that structure, you define your stages. For example, uh, on the left-hand side, I, def uh, I can define my pipeline as a sequence of Python modules. Uh, there's three stages, data pre-processing, which simply runs Python process data.py. There's a training stage, which runs Python train.py and evaluation stage. Or as I said, it can be just one Jupyter notebook where the notebook would be executed through command line by a nice uh, command line tool called paper mill, where you give it your notebook and some parameters and it executes your notebook top to bottom. All right, so once you have your pipeline defined, again, whether in Python modules or Jupyter notebooks, you can run it through uh, command line with a command dbc x run. And then you can tweak your runs, basically generate experiments by passing you hyperparameters uh, through command line as well. 
So here I'm setting number of estimators for my model to a new value of 120, and then DBC runs this new experiment. And I can generate like a few of these experiments. And then in VS Code, uh, we'll have a UI that will display all our experiments in this nice looking table where every row of the table is a, its own separate experiment. And different columns in the table are either metrics or parameters. So in this example, we can see there's like different values for number of estimators, maximum depth of decision trees. And I have different metrics such as F1 score and area under receiver operating curve. And obviously like you would pick a metric that you care about the most, let's say F1 score, sort them by the most, the highest value, and that will be your best performing experiment. Well, uh, enough talk, let's uh, do the live demo. So I showed you the GitHub repo before. So I have it here in my VS code. Uh, so there's a, in the readme file of that repository, there's a link to where the data set comes from. It lives on Kaggle data sets. Uh, kind of in short, the description is this data set is a CSV file, contains 10,000 records, where every record is a bank customer. Uh, and there's information about their credit score, geography, like which country they come from, how many, uh, I'm gonna assume that number of products means uh, how many different products of that bank they are using, whether they have a credit card, estimated salary. There are a couple of other columns that are not shown here, uh, but the column that we want to predict is a binary one called exited. Whether they cut, that customer eventually left the bank or kind of stayed with the bank as the customer. And obviously, if uh, in real scenario, if you can train a very well-performing model that can predict this, uh, that means uh, we can put some resources into retaining customers uh, as opposed to like spending more resources uh, attracting new customers. So that's kind of uh, would be our business problem. And I uh, kind of trained this model in, uh, a Jupyter notebook, there's nothing like new or uh, very interesting, like particularly interesting about this notebook. It has a very standard flow where we first set up some uh, parameters uh, for both our model and how we load and pre-process our data. We read our data set, like look at the first few lines. This is something that I just shown you in the readme file. We may do some data exploration, it'd be a good idea to do data exploration be before you train your model. Uh, so I'm checking for missing values, uh, looking up how uh, our customers spread out across different geographies and do some uh, data pre-processing, like splitting my data set into the features and targets and finally split into the train and test. And then I'm um, training my model. I wanna have an option training between render forest classifier from scikit-learn or like GPM classifier. Once the model is trained, I save it to a file and then uh, produce some evaluation plots. This is a normalized confusion matrix here uh, with, that compares like true labels versus predicted labels. And I'm also producing some uh, binary classification metrics. So F1 score and area under receiver operating curve. And I'm saving those metrics into a JSON file. So very standard. Uh, I don't think there is anything surprising or new here. Once I have my notebook defined, I can define my pipeline. Again, this is a like one stage pipeline that runs my notebook top to bottom with paper mill. I can also pass some parameters to this command and the parameters I defined in another text file uh, that controls kind of how data preprocessing is made, how I split data between train and test, and also uh, my, the hyperparameters of my model. Once I have those two components in place, I can start experimenting. So first thing that I would do is search for a DVC extension in VS Code Marketplace. So you can just type DVC and install the extension. I've already done that. And the extension appeared on the left-hand side uh, on this vertical bar here. And once we have the extension in place, we'll have the uh, experiments view. So here, what we see, as I've shown you, there's a 
our experiments, our metrics, and parameters. So there's a, this is the branch that I'm on. Uh, so these are the metrics that I have on this particular branch. And this is like my uh, workspace. So let's start experimenting. I can right click on the branch name and we'll see modify and run. So I can modify what I have on the branch and execute a new experiment. Let's change, let's say I want to change the maximum depth of the decision trees used in my random forest classifier. So I can check this parameter, set the value to some new number, let's say 10 and press enter. So uh, this data set is fairly small. So uh, the experiment generated uh, fairly quickly and we've got a new entry in our table. So this is my experiment. Uh, like this is its ID. I've got my new metrics that are slightly, just slightly better than what I had uh, on the branch by default. This is the new parameter that I used, right? Remember I set max depth from default five, I changed it to 10 and other parameters remain the same. So I can, uh, let's say, take this experiment and then build on top of it, but this time changing a different parameter, number of estimators, I'll set it from default 30 to let's do an even 100. And that generates another experiment, right? So now I've got two experiments. Uh, F1 score is very, is very similar across them. So looking at numbers is all fine and good, right? I eventually care about uh, F1 score, but it can also compare the plots between different experiments. For example, what I had on my default branch and the two new experiments that I generated are here. So here I can see uh, kind of this interactive plot of uh, receiver operating curve. All the lines are pretty close to each other because the performance of the models that I trained are very close. We'll see if we can improve it uh, later by doing some hyperparameter tuning. Uh, we can compare uh, confusion matrix uh, plots uh, against those experiments. Uh, and now let's uh, maybe do some uh, hyper auto automated hyperparameter tuning. So I have this script where I can define the grid for uh, let's say two hyperparameters that I care about for number of estimators. I wanna try 50, 100, and 150 for max depth values. That's gonna be uh, 10, 15, and 20. Uh, and then I iterate through these arrays and simply run my experiments from command line this time instead of the UI. So all I need to do once I have the script is, uh, let me first clean up the two experiments that I did manually. And now I can do my hyperparameter tuning by simply launching the script bash grid search. And what happens is now the script generates all those combinations for me and places those experiments in this experiment table. So now that the experiments are generated, as I mentioned, we can sort um, by ascending or descending. And here I can see that I did about like two percentage improvements uh, compared to what I had by default on this branch. We can uh, experiment even further. Let's say we change our model type to light GBM. Typically this is this type of model performs better than random forest. And we can again run our research script and see how that performs. So we get even more entries on our table. The table is automatically sorted. By this time, we got uh, what uh, over four percentage improvements. And let's say this is the experiment that I want to keep. So number of estimators, 150, max depth is 20. The model type that I'm using is LightGBM. So if I want to keep this experiment, I've got a few options if I right click on it. I can either apply it to my workspace. So let's do that right now and see what happens. And what happens is the state of my local files in my repository gets reset to the same state 
as it was when uh, DVC ran that experiment. It means that it reset my parameters to those values. It reset my metrics. It reset all the plots and basically everything. So, and that's what I meant by versioning everything when you run your experiments, right? So let's see uh, what other options we have here. So we can create a new branch out of it, uh, or we can like share it as a branch. So let's do that right now. So we're gonna say fourth brain uh, experiment. It's, we, this is gonna be the name of our experiment that we used. And it's gonna create that branch and push it to GitHub. So let me switch to GitHub. And there we go. So this is our uh, new branch that was uh, just pushed. And we can see that now DVC recorded everything that is needed to reproduce this experiment. Obviously my parameters are here. Uh, all my evaluation plots and metrics are also here. So even if I switch back to this experiment, to this branch a month from now, I'll be able to reproduce this experiment. And everything else, let's imagine I don't care about it. That can easily be cleaned up and poof, they are gone. So, and that's another problem that in my view, DVC uh, uh, extension for VS Code solves is that it allows you to avoid clutter in your experimentation UI. So let's uh, kind of bring this uh, home and refer back to the goals that we covered initially. So we talked about ability to generate many experiments. We've seen that it's very uh, easy to do and uh, we can generate as many entries in this table as we want. Secondly, reproducibility. We've seen that everything uh, is tracked with DVC, uh, like your parameters, your code. Like if I change my code, uh, how my model is trained, that all would be recorded with Git. And finally, I hope that it looks like a minimal setup because, well, I, I believe that your code should live in some kind of Git repo. If it doesn't, then it should. Uh, I imagine you would use some kind of ID eventually. Even if you, like these days, you spend most of your time in Jupyter notebooks, eventually, you will reach a point where you need to like refactor your Jupyter Notebook code into individual uh, Python modules. And uh, yeah, so no data lives uh, in any of the external services and databases. I mean, like that data lives in GitHub, but that's kind of unavoidable if you're using uh, some kind of Git solution already. So now that we've uh, covered that, the last thing that I uh, would like to bring up is you will notice that in our local repository, we've got a model job lib. So this is a model pickle that we'll see. We've got our data, which is a CSV file in here. But if we switch to GitHub, there is no CSV file itself, but there is a file that has the similar name, but has DVC extension. So this is a reference to the data set. Uh, that I use for training. So, uh, and this is the way that data, uh, DVC versions uh, data sets. It doesn't version the data itself, but it versions a reference that lives in some remote storage. Same goes for uh, the model. There's uh, like the model does not, like the actual model file does not live in that uh, directory. And this is brings me back to like an image that I want to show from uh, the readme file, and it's over here. So this is how uh, DVC and DVC pipelines approach uh, data versioning. Is that you already, on the left-hand side, we have Git that stores all your code and configs. And if you happen to have in your like local workspace, a large model file or a large data, uh, data set, what DVC will do is compute their reference to it, version it in Git, but the actual data, the actual large file will go into some 
remote storage, such as in the three bucket, Azure, uh, Google Cloud, and so on. And in my case, that remote storage is uh, an Amazon S3 bucket. So this is the DVC configuration file. And once I run my experiments and I want to push all my like new, if I have a new data set or a new model, it's as easy as running DVC push command. And I think DVC, even from command line, is fairly easy to learn because a lot of DVC syntax kind of mimics uh, Git syntax. So if you're familiar with Git, to push your Git changes, you would uh, type Git push and it would push your code to GitHub. In this case, DVC pushes my data versions to a remote storage. So that is it for live demo. Let's uh, just recap what we've covered so far. So common requirements for machine learning experimentation. Uh, there is a need for a uh, disciplined way of managing a large number of machine learning experiments. There is a need for versioning everything, code, configs, and data, because at the end of the day, an experiment is really that. It's a combination of code, configs, and data, and not just one of those things. Uh, and also with uh, like, we, we need some minimal kind of setup without uh, or with minimal external dependencies. And with this combination of Git, VS Code, and DVC pipelines, we can address all those requirements because we all know that we can use Git for versioning code and configs that live in text files. Now we know that we can use DVC for uh, generating machine learning pipelines and versioning large artifacts, such as data sets and models in your own infrastructure that you can control. And finally, we use VS Code for visualizing and managing machine learning experiments. So that is it for my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Alex, thank you so much. This was fantastic. Yeah, I really enjoyed the outline of the business problem on the front end, showing us exactly how to do the experimenting from tracking them to doing even automatic hyperparameter tuning and really breaking down where things were stored, both in Git and also through DVC. That was, that was really interesting. I, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your perspective on sort of this idea of GitOps and what its role is relative to people looking to get into MLOps and also maybe what you've seen in terms of people who are trying to maybe make the transition from DevOps to MLOps. So kind of a two-part question, right. you know, what, what is GitOps and then how should MLOps and DevOps folks think, think about them? Right. Uh, I have so many thoughts on this because we've internally had so many discussions about this, but let me try and condense this. So uh, I believe for uh, MLOps, like DevOps, uh, Git is a core, like is a core essential component. Like I'm gonna go as like, maybe make a radical statement that you cannot do MLOps if you're not using Git. Like that is like a, probably the most like black and white statement that's uh, gonna be there today. So yeah, use, use Git, uh, that's the first thing. As for GitOps, it's basically some, a set of standard practices for how to apply Git uh, within like a company and enterprise. It's not just uh, as simple as like Git add, commit and push everything to one branch. Uh, over time, software engineers, kind of the worldwide community of software engineers over decades working with Git, uh, developed some best practices that uh, when it comes to like branching your code, when uh, you develop certain features, when it comes to like tagging, like their Git concept of Git tags, when it comes to making uh, releases, uh, how do you version your releases with patches and so on and so forth. And because Git is a command line tool, like many people who've just started to use Git may find it very frustrating. I remember when I myself started learning Git a few years ago, it was a pain. Like 
the mental model that you need to build in your head to learn how Git works is very hard. It's not intuitive. But once you get a grasp of it and you realize the power of Git, like that's really where like Git powers CI CD like tools and the entire concept because it allows you to automate your deployments so that you don't need to log in into some UI, click a button here and there, copy paste some text from or configurations in order for your deployment to proceed to the next step. Because uh, like the opposite of it is kind of the joke in the community is called like click ops, is that you don't have automated deployments. You log in into a bunch of services, click on a bunch of buttons, and then eventually you make it to deployment. If there's no person to push those buttons, the deployment doesn't happen, right? So that's what you want to avoid. Uh, so that was the first question, GitOps, and what was the second one? Sorry, I missed that. Yeah, you know, I, I actually want to double click in a little bit. So as you mentioned, you know, you kind of had some difficulty when you got started with Git. And yep. a lot of times, We'll have students coming in. They're interested in, in, in really getting to know Git and GitHub. And they say sort of, I know the basics, you know, uh, push, commit. I know a few commands. And is that good enough? So if you were sort of giving your top level recommendations based on your journey, learning it, I mean, what would you learn next? Is there a core set of things that you should focus on as you're trying to get into Git and Git ops? I would say kind of, an overall overarching advice would be try and get, um, try and participate in the open source community of a project that you care about. Doesn't matter which one it is. And most open source communities are very welcoming to newcomers. And then you can pick up like, for example, on GitHub, uh, big open source project, they typically mark some issues as like beginner friendly or something. And then you can start fixing those problems. Even if it's just updating a typo in a readme, that's still a contribution. But that allows you to, like you will start looking up, okay, how do I create a fork of this repository and what a fork is? Like you make a change, you, you fix uh, that typo, you push it to your fork, and then you're like, okay, what's the next step? Okay, I need to create a pull request. So what is a pull request? And then you start like picking up those concepts and then you see like, oh, okay, I'm actually merging a branch from here to here. So I would advise against just learning Git on its own, but learn it as you need it. Uh, that would be my advice. And then mm -hmm. over time, like if you have problems, I'm sure people will help you out. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, you know, speaking of learn it as you need it, you know, we've got a, a lot of folks that are coming from data analyst backgrounds, data scientist backgrounds, aiming at being a machine learning engineer or an ML ops practitioner of some sort. Do you think that, you know, there's really a big difference between what these roles are in today's world, you know, data scientist, machine learning engineer, ML ops engineer, sort of, can you talk a little bit about your perspective and iterative's perspective on what the difference is between these roles in today's AI job market? And then maybe like talk a little bit about how Git might interact with each right. of them. Yeah, good, good question, good question. So uh, summarized in one sentence, data scientist today is pretty much a webmaster of uh, 20 years ago, right? It's kind of an overarching job title that has that pretty much everyone and every company uh, interprets the way they want. So you, your mental picture of what a data scientist is will vary depending on your experiments, uh, on your experience and what you've read online. Um, it kind of goes maybe applicable to some extent to like a data analyst. It varies very much from like one domain to another. So I'm gonna give you like my understanding and uh, like I'm sure there will be people in the audience who will disagree and that's fine because the industry right now, the machine learning and kind of data analytics, data science is still maturing and there will be more specialization to come. I'm sure, I'm sure of it 10 years from now, like we'll be laughing at a general data scientist title. <laughs> uh, so in my view, data analysts, uh, like there could be two big groups. There could be someone who's more into like business intelligence 
uh, analytics, someone who use like Tableau and Power BI and tools like that on their daily basis. And there could be like a pretty much a statistician who has a title of a data analyst. So that's a person who uh, will either work with like R and R Studio or Python and Jupyter Notebooks predominantly, uh, and maybe like generate some dashboards and some ad hoc reports every once in a while. Uh, data scientists, probably the person who's like has some overlap obviously with data analytics, but uh, knowledge of machine learning would be probably a must, some familiarity. Uh, like Jupyter Notebooks and some familiarity with popular IDEs such as VS Code or like PyCharm. Uh, within companies, these people are generally involved with at least building proof of concepts. Like, can we at least, like, is it at least possible to train this predictive model for our problem? And they would, part if it's, if the prototype is successful, then they would participate in some uh, uh, productionization process of this model. As for machine learning engineers, these are the people who are like primarily responsible for bringing an ML prototype to production. That would be if they get uh, a Jupyter notebook, uh, these are the people who would help or directly participate in refactoring it into like a Python application, let's say, uh, who would like set up some training infrastructure for data scientists that they need to train on like deep, large deep learning models and they need GPU infrastructure. Like they might not be equipped with the necessary skills to do that. So an uh, ML engineer would help them out. And as for MLOps engineer, the person who I envision kind of the ideal profile would be uh, the person who kind of is familiar with machine learning, maybe not in depth, not at the level that they know all the math like behind every algorithm, but they know what is like, the, for example, the difference between training, testing, and validation data? Like, why do they exist? Uh, the fact that like deep learning models can be very big and like be gigabytes in size, for example, for really large models. So you need a way to manage those. Uh, they would typically, like, especially in this environment, they would be familiar with some system administration and cloud infrastructure um, and uh, CI CD tools such as GitHub Actions, GitLab CI. Uh, many companies use Jenkins, so there's a lot of CICD tools, but the general flow is the same. So does that answer the question? I yeah, that's... yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's really helpful. And it's great to get your perspective on the industry because everybody has one these days, as you know. So yeah. um, it looks like we've got a, a question from DeWall. And DeWall's interested to know about DVC. And... Can DVC actually be used in terms of versioning and tracking the files related to data annotation and ground truth data preparation? Uh, right. So that is like it doesn't do data kind of labeling and management. Like that's what I assume data annotation uh, means here. Like it would version it as it would version like your raw data same way, uh, but there are tools out there that uh, allow you to kind of more efficiently version uh, labels. Uh, and there is actually one tool that Iterative is uh, about to release uh, later this year. Uh, like the short of it is the idea is to kind of version the labels and the ground truth again in the remote storage. But what you have locally would be essentially like pointers to those labels so that. Every time you change the data set, you don't have to move large amounts of data back and forth from your machine to the cloud. Okay, okay. So if I'm doing, if I scope a business problem and if I'm doing exploratory data analysis, I come up with something that I like. Then I set up sort of a simple data pipeline to yep. do the transformation, to do the ETL extract, transform, and load process. Does data version control come in and like, what does data version control do exactly along that ETL pipeline? Right, uh, where the like DVC pipelines are uh, kind of special is uh, because of the data versioning that they rely on. So for example, data extraction or data cleaning stages can take a long time, right? And if you split your pipeline into individual stages, DVC will 
uh, kind of relying on Git for uh, monitoring code changes and using and also monitoring data changes, it will figure out what exactly it needs to uh, uh, needs to rerun. Imagine that you are only want to tune your uh, hyperparameter, uh, the hyperparameters of your model. Do you need to rerun the like time-consuming data loading and data preprocessing stage? Probably no. Like you don't want to waste time and effort doing this. So DVC will only rerun stages that it needs to rerun in order to ensure reproducibility. Like uh, a good example would be in this project. I started with uh, just monitoring F1 score, but later I figured like I might want to add area under receiver operating curve just to see kind of how it behaves. And I don't need to rerun my entire pipeline, the data prep, model training, just to compute another metric. And when I add that metric to my evaluation stage, like DVC just reruns the evaluation stage and computes the new metric. Mm, yeah, that modular approach is something that we're seeing across all the managed and open source tools. Everybody's yeah. continuing, I think, to move towards modularity. Once you get it going, then it's really important to have that modularity to be able to tactically um, expand, scale different components. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. We've got um, one other question from the audience from D. Darhi. He says, any guesses as to why WAND, you know, weights and biases and ML flow are kind of unreliable in producing experiments as, as you showed? Um, I was under the impression that they're quite wildly adopted is uh, part of the question. Right, they're wildly adopted and people over time who have been using them for a long time, myself included, have learned that you can you have to be disciplined on how you uh, version your code because they do record your git commit. So oftentimes what you need to do if you want to use them reliably is you have to commit all your code and then run your experiments and then then it makes it reproducible because you can run, you can rely on that particular git commit because it's like a snapshot of your code. But if you uh, change a bunch of things, have not committed them, and run your experiments, it will record your Git commit, but you've made a bunch of changes to the code in between, and those were not recorded. And this is actually how I got those screenshots. I just, in, for some experiments, I changed my data. Uh, I removed like a couple of rows uh, from the data to reduce the model performance. For others, I changed my uh, machine learning uh, model, types of models that I used and also got different performance. And that was unfortunately not recorded. Okay, so that the fact that you weren't doing the click ops on that particular model demonstration uh, really allowed us to see where a uh, really Git ops focused approach can come in and be very, very helpful. You're essentially manually doing Git ops if you wanna get it right, is that correct? Right, you have to be disciplined about like which version of the code you're using to yeah. uh, run those experiments exactly. Experiment tracking, it's a non-trivial endeavor. Wow, Alex, thank you so much for today's great presentation, for, for having teaching me. us about DVC. You know, I, I think that I think that that is going to go ahead and and bring us to the end of today's event. Thank you all for your great questions. We hope that you've enjoyed your time with us and that you've got a few lessons learned about GitOps, about ClickOps, about DVC, about where to leverage it in your next project. And, you know, Fourth Brain is very grateful for the opportunity to showcase Iterative in this event and in our courses, both our machine learning engineer program and our machine learning operations program, and also many of the custom corporate training programs that we run incorporate aspects of DVC. Additionally, for all of you that were sort of watching VS Code today, our courses very much leverage Git, the Unix command line interface, Jupyter Notebooks, and VS Code. And if you're interested in how to get started with MLOps software development tools like DVC, it's absolutely critical that you start by setting up your IDE, your interactive development environment. And on Wednesday, September 28th, I'll be running a live demo in partnership with deeplearning.ai called Beyond Jupyter Notebooks. 
MLOps environment setup and first deployment. So if you're into how to get started with CLI, VS Code, Fast API, and Docker to build and deploy your first ML app on your workstation, whether it's Mac OS, Windows, or Linux, then definitely check that out and register today. I'd also like to give a shout out to the fact that we've got an additional event coming up next Wednesday that after working with hundreds of alumni over the past few years, Fourth Brain's curriculum and career services staff has developed a framework with key strategies that you can implement today to find your focus, showcase your unique skills, and achieve that ML career step that you're looking to achieve next. So just like we're trying to help you go beyond Jupyter Notebooks, we're trying to also help you go beyond video courses to actually become that machine learning engineer out in industry. So please join us for that interactive webinar next Wednesday, September 21st at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. And beyond that, please check out fourthbrain.ai for more information on our upcoming MLE and MLOps course offerings to learn more about what we're doing. Our next 16-week MLE program launches October 18th. That's it for today. We look forward to continue bringing you more demo events delivered by experts soon, as we believe it's one of the best ways to teach and learn together. Feel free to reach out to me directly at greg at fourthbrain.ai if there are any events that you'd love to see but haven't yet. We'll see you next time. Until then, keep learning.